Hi, everyone. Welcome to Family Matters. We are happy to have you join us today. For this episode, we are joined by Dr. William Mansbach, the founder and CEO of Mansbach Health Tools, which supports the BCAT Research Center. He is the CEO and president of CounterPoint Health Services, and which specializes in geriatrics and dementia care. Welcome, Dr. Mansbach. Thank you, Abby. It's nice to be here again with you. So to start, we're just going to do a quick review of kind of your roles and what you do. So can you share a little bit with our families um, about your role at CounterPoint Health Services and the National Brain Health Center? Well, sure. Happy to do that. Uh, so, so CounterPoint is a behavioral health, mostly geriatrically focused group. We take care of adults and largely older adults in the community, in nursing homes, in senior living communities, um, where there are questions about uh, mood or cognition or behavior. It's an interprofessional model. So we have psychiatry, psychological services, working together. And when we take care of people in long-term care settings, we're also working, of course, with their primary care physicians and with the nursing staff and other allied members of those of those teams. So you, when people think about CounterPoint, they think about providers taking care of patients. And CounterPoint is located uh, in uh, the DC metropolitan area, Maryland, uh, and in Virginia. The, the, the National Brain Health Center is, uh, is different. It's actually an initiative that um, comes from both CounterPoint and the BCAT Research Center. Uh, it's a relatively, well, actually very new program. And the idea of the Brain Health Center is to provide a national platform for people who are beginning to struggle or have been struggling with memory and related cognitive issues. But also, Abby, to try to give people an opportunity to work on preventive strategies to begin to do certain brain healthy activities that would um, lower the risk of developing dementia like Alzheimer's disease, certainly um, changing the age of onset, trying to push that way out. And if people do develop dementia, we want them to progress at much slower rates than what they progress right now. So that kind of leads me into you know, the topic that we're gonna be discussing today and memory impairments. And you mentioned brain health and prevention. So before we mm -hmm. get into um, a little bit more about memory impairments, I'd like for you to share with our families listening about how the brain actually makes memories. I think it's important to understand how memories are formed before we can discuss that disruption in the memory process. Sure. It's a great way to begin. Uh, I should say that the brain is really wondrous, isn't it? It's amazing how complex it is, the one organ that can contemplate itself, uh, as far as we know, uh, and kind of unpacking the, the mechanics of the brain. Uh, and it's taken a long time. The first real memory model uh, was developed uh, in 1968, further refined in 1972. And, you know, our team and others really try to think about it from a very practical even clinical perspective sometimes. So essentially there, there are four steps to making a new memory. Um, so there's an, a step of encoding, which I can talk about in a minute, a step of consolidation. Then there is uh, long-term storage. And then of course, retrieval it doesn't really help you very much if you can store all this information, but you can't access it in any way. It involves the whole brain uh, or much of the brain. The encoding process, starts in sort of where your forehead is in the prefrontal cortex. And it sends information, this is part of consolidation, lower in the brain to the hippocampus in the limbic system where the consolidation process begins. And consolidation for memory is like consolidation anywhere else. It's just a way of kind of working that memory groove, making what is temporary more permanent. Uh, interestingly enough, most of that takes place while we sleep. So it's sort of an interesting kind of tidbit about um, why sleep is really important. Um, and then the hippocampus becomes like the, it's like the COO of the company. If the, if the prefrontal area here is the CEO 
in the C-suite. The COO is really the uh, hippocampus. It indexes memory and it sends it to storage all over the brain. And then when it needs to retrieve it, it knows where that is. And that's the whole retrieval process. So encoding, consolidation, long-term storage, and retrieval. There's actually a lot involved in making a memory. There's a lot. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's important to note, you know, as we begin to discuss about um, the impairments and the disruption and kind of the breakdown. So now that we know how the memories are formed and the different steps and processes that are required, I want to discuss a common misconception that we hear. You, you know, when you hear the term memory impairment, there's a lot of immediate judgment. Is it dementia? Is it MCI or a mild cognitive impairment? Is it just normal senility, being senile? Can you talk a little bit first about normal aging and what that sure. looks like? And then a little bit about what it means to have a memory impairment. Yes, uh, th that's a very important distinction. People will get very uh, concerned, don't they? When they start mm -hmm. having some gaps in memory, some errors in memory, they think, oh my goodness, does this mean I have Alzheimer's disease or some other dementia? So sure. Um, as we age, starting really at age roughly 40 uh, and progresses as we get older, our memories become less efficient often. That doesn't mean we, we lack the capacity. And, and therein is the real difference between normal forgetfulness uh, and sort of the more pathological process that you would expect in dementia. Um, and there are lots of neurophysiological reasons for why uh, we have normal forgetfulness. Those Billions of neurons get smaller, the gap of communication gets wider, we get distracted with other things that are going on. Certainly this isn't um, just for older adults, but uh, depression, anxiety can interfere in the encoding process. If it doesn't get encoded, you know, we can't consolidate it, then we can't store it, then we can't retrieve it, as we talked about before. Um, so I think people should expect a normal amount of, uh, of just forgetfulness. Um, the difference is that uh, people who become forgetful could still make a new memory because the structure of the brain is really working. Um, so we, we describe a subjective memory complaint when somebody says, oh, I'm just not remembering as well or I'm more forgetful. But it's important to move that to an objective memory complaint. And that's when you do a test like, like the BCAT or something like that from a healthcare professional that can confirm that you really do have something that's, that's going on. So don't, don't worry if you're just a little bit more forgetful. That's just a normal part of aging. That's comforting to many, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. having a memory impairment always mean that the individual has a mild cognitive impairment or an MCI or a dementia, or can there just be a memory impairment? Uh, can you explain a little bit about the differences and if there's any similarities among those diagnoses? Sure. So take forgetfulness or a little bit of forgetfulness aside, like I can't remember that river we crossed or somebody's name or whatever. I mean, that, that can happen in normal, in normal aging. We think about memory like we think about cognition, Abby, as a continuum. It's sort of the normal errors that we make on one end. Dementia on the far end, on the other end, where, where we lack the capacity to do certain things like make new memories uh, and other, other cognitive domain deficits, of course. But there's the sort of middle ground that we refer to as, um, and, and no doubt some people have heard this, mild cognitive impairment or MCI. We also refer to it in, psych, uh, in psychology and in neuropsychiatry. Um, as mild neurocognitive disorder, it doesn't mean a person has dementia, but it does mean that they could have, um, particularly in something called amnestic MCI, memory MCI, in other words, where they really do have a memory uh, impairment. It's a real impairment. It can get in the way of everyday living, um, but, it, but it doesn't mean that it meets the threshold of dementia. Uh, people can still live independently or reasonably independently if they have a amount of support. And one thing I will say that, that's exciting about research that's done at the National Brain Health Center is that we've been able to demonstrate through this program that we have, um, maybe we can get to that, that people with MCI can actually improve, many of them improve when they go through this particular memory and, and, and other protocol through brain health coaching that we do. And um, it's a very exciting thing because we can bring a sense of optimism uh, rather, than all, uh, rather than a sense of doom that this means that I'm gonna develop dementia over time. 
So that's an important thing to note that just because there's memory impairments, it doesn't mean that there's nothing, you know, that doesn't mean that it is a dementia. There's, it's an important um, difference to discuss. So one of the next steps when it comes to memory impairments, you know, one of the questions is, okay, now we know that my mom or my loved one has a memory impairment. Now what? What can we do next? Yeah, I guess the first thing, Abby, is, is to really take a good look at how do you know they really have a memory impairment? Uh, I have to say that memory impairments in particular like with the diagnosis of dementia are, are typically, uh, unfortunately, quite, at least quite often misdiagnosed. They're either um, identified as, a person's identified as having a memory impairment when they really don't, or they really do have a memory impairment, but it's not, oh, that's just, you know, Bob getting older or whatever. So, so you have to make sure that there was a proper test that was done. Um, I don't think it's adequate to just have someone have an MRI and say, oh, well, then they don't or they do. I think you really need some sort of neuropsych test or BCAT certainly to you know to get started. So, so if you do that and you do have a memory impairment, depending on its level of impairment, there are things that you can do. So we advocate something called the Brain Health Seven, and you might be thinking, well, what what is the Brain Health Seven? It, it really focuses on the seven modifiable behaviors that are most associated with improving memory and cognition. Uh, so at the National Brain Health Center, we teach people what that is. They get a lot of coaching that way. Um, they're interested in, in doing that. We look at, um, uh, we look at uh, physical exercise. We look at cognitive exercise, very specific working memory exercises. They have to be carefully prescribed. We look at ways of lowering um, cortisol and other uh, sometimes harmful um, and sort of hormonal releases, and we do that through meditation. We look at diet. We look at sleep. That sleep is really, uh, really important. We look at mood. We look at um, social interaction, those, those seven things. So um, there really are things that you can do with memory impairment. Uh, but the first rule is to identify that you have it and then to try to arrest it, stop it from getting worse, uh, and then build supports around it. And I think you bring up a great point. It's not just about working the brain. There's the brain health components are extremely important to help uh, mitigate any kind of further decline. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, you know, once you get that diagnosis and once there has been a confirmed memory impairment present, are there any useful strategies that you can think of that can help the individual with the impairments kind of compensate for those deficits? Again, depending on the the level of impairment, I I think that there are, but they're 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 teachable strategies. So I can't just say, well, you have to um, work on let's say building association memories, uh, which is a whole sort of approach to helping people recall things that maybe um, they're having difficulty recalling. Um, I think that there's some strategies for improving encoding. I think there's strategies for improving consolidation. I think there are strategies for improving uh, retrieval. All of them, though, require um, uh, probably five times a week. You know, that's sort of the magic number, it seems like, 15 or 20 minutes a day doing very specific prescribed cognitive exercises. Um, and, and, you know, what, one can go to different sources to do that. I, I always say, though, make, make sure that wherever you go, whatever resource you use, it has some real science. It's evidenced by science, not just sort of loosely based on science. So uh, I, I know at our place, we focus a lot on these working memory exercise books, and we focus on the digital versions of that. You don't have to use those. I mean, there are some other ones that you can, you know, you can, you can use there. Also, um, there are social strategies that are important. And, you know, there's a lot of shame sometimes or embarrassment when people have memory difficulties. I mean, it kind of stands to reason that there would be. But building a network around you is, is really uh, important because people can, can help you. They can understand. They can repeat. They can do things that would really allow you to be much more independent. So don't go at this alone. It's important that you have people in your life that you know care about you, that can support you. You didn't do anything wrong, you know. If you have some memory impairment, it's not your fault. Uh, it's just 
something that it's a medical condition that you can do some things for. And there are lots of things not to do. So um, I'm sure I've said, many people have heard me talk about the dangers of um, the supplements. You know, that there's, there's very little science on a lot of these supplements. And it's a real opportunity cost because you can be doing, using one of them rather than doing sort of the hard work of the cognitive exercises. So I think people need to be really careful about uh, the slick advertising that's out there. Now, this is probably not why you want me on here today to talk about sort of the, you know, the, the over-the-counter, you know, remedies that are out there. It's the hard work that makes a difference. And, and you can do it and you can get, uh, you can get better. So you mentioned about how people might feel, you know, embarrassed or ashamed of these memory impairments. Um, I'd yeah. like to talk a little bit about how time sensitive, you know, having a memory impairment is and what to do about it and next steps and any other additional insights you could offer for families and those loved ones going through with this type of issue. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you're mentioning that, Abby, because, um, there's a natural tendency to delay, to deny or be embarrassed or whatever. The, the problem is that the train is already out of the station. So the longer you wait, the harder it is and the less effective we can be as healthcare providers to kind of turn this around in some ways. So I would say to anyone who's listening here, if you have any issue about it, um, you should really have a conversation with your primary care physician or whoever you're comfortable with. If you um, want to privately um, do a cognitive self-assessment, you can do one, you know, uh, for free on uh, enrichvisits.com. Just go to the, do the my mem check. If you'd like to do a, not a full BCAT, but a BCAT uh, short form, a screening tool, you can do it on the same website. That'd be fine. Uh, don't delay. You know, just just get to the bottom of it. Figure out what's going on. So. Oh. I appreciate the fact that, you know, we shouldn't delay. What do we do next? You know, we hear all the time about um, there's a wait to get into these kinds of, um, to get help. There's a way to see doctors. There's a way to see any kind of healthcare mm -hmm. professional about memory. So I'd like to talk a little bit and wrap up our conversation on what, what options are out there for next steps when someone has been identified as having a memory impairment and they want to work on their memory and get better? Um, do you have any kind of recommendations or suggestions on next steps? Well, you really you put your finger on it, Abby. So I, I know that when people come to us for the neuropsych battery and all that, um, often they're looking at six months to a year delay from some other provider wherever they live. And so we tried to get people in a little bit more quickly, but I don't think you need that necessarily. I, I would start with the right resources. So at the National Brain Health Center, whether you do anything there or not, you can get information about, does this really seem like a real problem? You know, where might I be able to go? And um, one of the things that's been so helpful is the coaching aspect of all that, and that you can't get in too many places. To be a certified brain health coach where you have a real focus on cognition and memory, it's hard to do. Um, and that might actually take some of the, um, uh, some of the tension away of, of finding yet another provider. So people are interested in finding out about any of this, these resources or, or the Brain Health 7, as I mentioned, or maybe brain health coaching. I think the best way to do that is to email the BCAT as one of the sponsors of that center. Uh, it's just info at the BCAT.com. Just write in there what your question is or information that you might want with some contact information. Someone from the team will get back to you. We'll get back to you. And um, we just really want to make sure that people get the resources and the right information as quickly as possible. That's our mission. Thank you so much. And thank you for uh, sh shedding some insight onto this topic and providing us with this excellent information. We really appreciate and value um, your insight. So thank you, Dr. Mansbach, and thank you to everyone nice joining to us. Here. Okay. Thanks again.